Hello everybody, Reggie Time here again with uh, the latest in my week-long releasing of shorter videos whilst I toy around with different formats of video production and then um, different tables, different speeds, different everything really, just trying to figure out what people like and what they don't like so much as I try to <clears throat> gear up for when I start producing videos more professionally. Uh, this video is expected to run for around 30 minutes if you could stick with it the whole way through. Um, I'd really be quite grateful. And if you could give me feedback either in the comment section on YouTube or on the various um, sites where I post a link to the video, I would be most grateful. So thank you very much. Without any further ado, let's get into the video. I'm going to play it back at double speed for now um, because I expect it to be a little bit slow with it being just regular tables rather than speed book tables. Uh, we're going to label the tables 1, 2, 3 and 4. Um, and just to give someone a little bit of thought on the tables before <clears throat> I get too far into it, the first three tables, tables 1, 2 and 3, um, I chose without any table selection. And I couldn't find a fourth table because uh, it was recorded quite early in the morning on 888. So I just started my own and fortunately a couple of players sat me quite quickly. So on we go, we isolated a limper on table 3 with pocket 10s, obviously completely standard. And the plot comes down King 7 4 Rainbow. Um, I don't know anything about this guy, we've got five hands on him. He's played 75 percent of them so far, and that's literally all the notes. It's probably going to be some kind of weak player, but um, who knows in what way he's going to play it. He could be um, loose aggressive or really bad loose aggressive. He could just be loose passive. He could be a mixture. Um, it's impossible to say. We just know at the minute he's likely shaping up to be bad. Um, this board. He doesn't have to have a king here. I think it's a fine board to see, but we can definitely get called by probably most pocket pairs, I would imagine. I don't think this sort of player votes a pocket pair to one C bet. Um, certainly some draws, he can have some cut shots. Who knows, just some A size. I don't think there's just a ton of hands that he can, he can call that C bet with. And on this table four here at the same time, we isolated um, a player with a light blue tags, bottom limp. We see bet this flop because it means we have two overcards packed off flush draw. There's lots of ways we can improve on the turn if we get called, but then um, this is obviously it's a bad turn, so I'm not going to continue trying to bluff somebody when the stack to pot ratio is getting close to where he can just jam over any bet. Well, not close to, he actually can just jam over any bet and make me fold. So here I was hoping just to get a cheap showdown, and here uh, I was going to be better for value. So I did bet. He min raised me. I see no reason to continue at this point against that type of player. So I just folded. And this player bets when I checked to him and again. I think folding is absolutely fine there. Bottom left table. If we saw there, I checked there to have a look at this guy. Because he's, he's really quite aggressive. He doesn't, I mean, just to go through my hoods uh, very quickly, we have EP, PFR, Steel, 3-bet, Fault, 3-bet on the top line, and then we have C-bet flop, Fault to C-bet, C-bet turn, C-bet river. And um, I checked the guy there, and his pop-up did come up. He went away very quickly, but he had, um, in fact, I think we will just actually just rewind it back so we can get the guys pop up and we can see there <coughs> he has a only it's only a sample of four but he has a hundred percent bet when checked to by the preflop razor um so with this in mind and with it i think it um yeah i could get value by betting obviously but i think here He's 
betting range when I check is going to be wider than this calling range. So I elected to just take a check and call three streets line against this guy. And again, as you can see, I'm bringing this pop up. This is what I do always when I'm when I'm using um, a hood. And I'm looking specifically at aggression frequency down the streets, which stays pretty high. Typically, you'll see these numbers drop off significantly on the turn in the river. And then um, quite often you'll see aggression frequencies of 40, 30, 25. This guy is very aggressive. He's got a one man sort of like 54%. He keeps the aggression up. So, um, yeah, my line was to try and use that aggression against him by just. just I was just going to check call all three streets here. Um, obviously, when he starts bombing like this, you're never too. You always get a little bit nervous, but then obviously, when we do with the boards. Um, I was going to obviously check call down and just turned up there with with seven six of spades, which makes some sense. But I, I think he doesn't have to have seven six of spades there to take that line. I just think he's probably the sort of guy who just makes big bets versus any kind of weakness. So I'm going to exploit that as often as I can until I think he's adjusting to me personally. And then um, expect him to take a while before he finds that adjustment. It's probably ingrained in him just to just to play that style. I don't think he's going to adjust to one individual. Uh, when this guy donks out on this board. Yeah, sure, we have a couple of back doors, but I'm not in the business of trying to outplay his son is looking like they're going to be a bad aggressive player. I'm just going to try and wait to make a hand against him. On table four here, um, I think we used to have a pretty easy fold on the river. I mean, I, I bet the flop for some thin value. I just take it back just ever so slightly. Uh, I bet the flop for thin value, and it is thin, but I had the back door heart draw. The six of hearts on the turn. It's kind of a good and a bad cat for me because at least if I was already behind. From that, I picked up some quite significant equity, and then um, I don't think I can bet for value anymore on that board. It's just way too wet. It's going to be too hard to get any kind of value. Um, so I was happy to check call the turn, and then when the river breaks off, um, I'm just going to fold. Yeah, I'm getting a decent price and getting like three to one plus from the pot. Uh, but I just don't think I'm going to be good anywhere near enough there to to warrant calling. So. I just made a fold. I almost checked the turn there on table three, but um, I think we have enough equity to, if we get called, we can maybe just take it to short down. And unfortunately, we picked a time to bluff when they we're well, not bluff, but go thin. And just slightly the wrong time. Well, no, I'm fine with. With the way I played the hand there. As you can see, all of these tables, even though I did, and I, I genuinely did just randomly pick these first three tables, we, we have some quite good games. I mean, I just don't think you see games of this quality when you're playing on many other sites to 888 or when you're playing speed book it's very rare you'll see a table where we have unfortunately the seats have got uh, armor tables and that good this table three is probably not too bad we've got the second best seat on on the weakest player but on table one we have two what look like they're going to be pretty bad players but unfortunately both to our direct left and on this table, it looks like we've got the worst way to add direct left. If I was game selecting, I would probably keep these tables just because we have such good quality weak players at them. But um, ideally, you would like to be, you'd like to have these guys to your direct right if possible. But um, no, we'll just take it. We'll take it for what it is. Pretty pleased with the tables considering I didn't put too much thought into the selection.
and to see him checking a guy's donk bet percentage, it was 20%. So, um, it doesn't really tell me too much, but it's just something that I like to know. I mean, the 20% range, it means he's, he's obviously donking more than just nutted hands. Um, for example, if you're just betting around 7 8%, we could look at it and think, well, yeah, he's only donking like two pair plus type hands. If we get to 15%, maybe there's some draws in there too. When you get to 20%, I think you're going to have draws, two pair plus, ace X, and maybe just some complete air balls in there. So, I mean, although I'm not delighted to recall in Betstrom, uh, as someone who plays 52 slash 1. That said, we've got too much equity. We've got second pair, uh, backdoor straight draws, backdoor flush draws. Um, obviously, we can turn trips or two pair and, and be golden too. So, we just donks a dollar. I don't see much value in raising. Um, the ace on the turn isn't a terrible card for us. It makes it less likely he has one. But um, even if he does check, I'm not likely to bet into it. And just trying to try and have a cheapest showdown if I can. I mean, if he checks a river two, I think I would definitely value bet then. But when he bets two, so we're getting like three and a half to one here. I don't think it's going to be good very often. I think he's going to have an ace or who knows, maybe some random king. Um, but I think it's going to be good often enough to make the call here. It's, it's, it's a definition of a crying call. And usually when we have a crying call, we're probably best to actually make the fold. But it's a crying call. Getting pretty good odds. So, um, yeah. I unhappily made it. And unfortunately, he had kind of what I thought he's probably going to have at least, you know, a lot of the time, which is some weak ace. But, um, yeah, we only put $3 in post slot. It's not that we put a lot of money in there. Here again, the table one. Check calling, uh, sorry, calling an under the gun raise with a hand as weak as Jack Nine suited wouldn't normally be in my playbook. Well, it's a 62.38 that's making the race. And um, I obviously just want to play as many pots against this guy as I can. So that's why I made the call. If it was a regular who'd, um, who'd made that open, I'd be much less inclined to make the call. Um, he makes quite a large C bet. I mean, I don't think I can fold at this point. We're, uh, too much equity, way too much equity, and then the river when it comes down. I mean, yeah, of course, he can certainly have a better hand than me that he's checked the turn with. But that said, I think we can also be winning against some some hands too. He can have a hand like it's ten that he decided to check the turn that might call. He could have who knows. I mean, yeah, sixty-two, thirty-eight, but um. There's nothing stopping you having pocket queens, pocket kings, something like that here. Um, well, not pocket queens, but you lose. But pocket kings, pocket aces, ace jack. Who knows? He's terrible. He could have a six eight, a nine eight, a nine ten. There's tons and tons of worse hands he can call with. So I elect to just like kind of like put a blocking bet in the river, thinking he can definitely call with worse. And there, if he raises, I think it's have a pretty easy fold. And he starts typing shit in the chat box, so I'm presuming that he's, he may be folding a big hand there. And he's got a little bit irritated with the run out, and this carries on for quite a while. And then um, it does lead, his reaction to that does lead to some quite interesting spots that I get into later with him. But, um, I'm not going to sprawl now, but this, we do we do get involved in this kind of couple of pots later on. Um, the, this dynamic of him constantly chatting in the chat box and kind of if he's a regular doing that I might think maybe he's faking tilt but I actually think this guy the way he was reacting the way he was playing probably was a kind of quite a bad angry aggressive type of player so um, we'll see that as the video goes on here we have a super standard 3 bet against a player I don't expect to ever fold anything he's opening when 64 18s open the pot, they usually not fall into any three bets. So I made a larger than usual three bet. I think made it 13 blinds, 
which is really quite large and very, you may consider its middle position versus button it's a large sizing but I'm absolutely fine with it um, and then I just quickly tagged him there in case I busted him and I lost him we have a super standard C bit here let's try and set stacks up so we can make a decent turn jam and um, as you can see we got the stack set up so I was just like two thirds pot um, the king isn't the best of cards I mean he can absolutely have some jack x in his range but he can also have every worst two pair as well so I think the jam is fine there Here on table four, we flop a set um, with two probably what I suspect are bad players. Um, I lead the turn once the flop checks through and the ace hits. And I could go for a check raise on the turn, I guess, because um, when he checks back the flop, ace x is a big part of his range and it hits. Um, and I kind of didn't want to risk the guy checking back again. I mean, I don't mind checking one street going for a raise, but. I don't want to be checking too many streets with my fires and then obviously this river this river comes it isn't great for us but I still think our hand is too strong to bet too strong to check um, I think he's going to see bet his flush draws a decent enough amount of the time maybe he didn't always see bet them but I think most players see bet flush draws these days so I'm not that worried about the flush I'm more annoyed at the fact that it may just have killed my action from the ASX a little bit I can't remember, but I would hope I went ahead and bet. And I did. And I don't actually remember this hand at all. He folded. Probably why I don't remember it. As you can see, as I go along there, just I like to attack players. I think it's important, especially for future game selecting, that we. Tag players, if we don't have a note to make on them for now, just give them a colour tag so then next time we're surfing the lobby trying to figure out you know what's a good table, what's a bad table. We're gonna be able to do it a lot easier. The more players we have tagged, the easier it is. There's nothing worse than seeing a lobby full of players and you've got no tags on them and you're just constantly switching tables in and out because you get there and you realise you've got say eighty hands on someone and they're and and they're a nit that you didn't tag or you know, they're a, they're a rock or a, or a regular that's not tagged. It's really quite frustrating. Um, I'm not sure I remember this Queen's hand too. Yeah, probably because nothing happens, I would imagine, if I don't remember it. You usually I remember my big hands. It was only around 12 hours ago that I made the video, so my memory typically isn't that bad. So on table three again we have a very 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 standard isolation. And again we flop well, which is always nice when you flop well. It's a shame the guy didn't have anything he could call us with. These are like sometimes the sort of weak players that can often frustrate us. Because um you know we flop top pair against them and we see how loose and bad they are. And you kind of feel a little bit cheated when you don't get any value. But it's important not to get frustrated. We just we'd be very grateful that we've got these players in our games and um, just trust that you'll get your fair share of value from them long term. And if today isn't the day you're getting your value, or today's the day that you're never making a hand you can buy you bet, that's just life. Um don't let it affect your future play, you just gotta get on with it. Uh, table two here. I didn't try and bluff this guy. He, fair enough, it's a small sample size, but it didn't look to me like he was starting to get that into folding. And A7 has some showdown value. Um, so I wasn't really that inclined to start betting it against him because I would definitely be bluffing. I think it's hard to see with the value betting. And then, um, 
and do you remember this son we get to the river and he finally bets and my thoughts were you know if he had a three or a five that he was going to bet or an eight maybe he would have bet it before now I thought he surely would have bet a jack on the turn so I kind of thought this he had a lot of air in his range here um, and if he is going to be seeing the value with a three or a five then then congratulations to him he's made a good bet but Kind of thought an awful lot of air here, tons and tons and tons of fans you can have where just A7's just beating a lot of them. Even though it's quite a large bet, this type of player I felt was going to be bluffing off enough to, to make the call. Um, so I think I did call yes and unfortunately he shows me a flush which is, you know, that's just life sometimes. I mean yeah, I probably would have lost an even bigger pot had I bet for value slash protection. He probably would have made it to the river with me and and I probably would have lost more by betting at least a flop and maybe the turn two. So yeah, even though I paid him off on the river. And there's still I'm still reasonably happy with the call. Table one. A very, very predictable C bet there with our not flush draw. Yeah, the board's not great for us in terms of his range. Um, because it's, we're not going to get too many falls on there. But we don't need too many falls when we've got that much pot equity when we had the not flush draw. Here's the hand I didn't, I wasn't at all happy with. With this hand, really. This guy, he's played with him quite a lot. He's, he's, um, he's somebody who, I've had to report with chat abuse before. He's just a generally unpleasant character to play with. And I think I sometimes allow these players to get under my skin when I probably shouldn't. Um, and I defended the 5 4 suit. I don't think it's a terrible defend, but against a loose aggressive opponent, it's probably quite good. Um, it can't take too much heat. So, yeah, I'd kind of wish I'd either just 3 bet this or fold in it. But I think I looked at his. Is that to me? I think I went for the pop up. I didn't actually, but I did look at it. And it is um, his four to three bit isn't isn't that big. Forty two percent, especially blind versus blind. I think we're not going to get too many falls, and I don't particularly want to play um, a bloated plot against a reasonably skilled aggressive opponent with just five high. So I just went to peel and. Hope there were some flops where I would be able to take the pot away from them on future streets, or you know, maybe who knows, just flop, a, flop two pair of flush. I mean, it can flop quite well, but I didn't really have much of a plan other than flop a hand, which isn't really good enough. And for a preaching to my students, they should have a plan. And I didn't really have a plan here other than flop something, which yeah, I was quite disappointed with this. Um, he bets the flop, and I think I just meekly fought my cut shot on my. Backed off for sure, and then yeah, I just wasn't wasn't really at all happy with how I played that at any point. I don't think I think I could maybe do something on the flop. I think I should, probably shouldn't defend that too often pre-flop. Yeah, I mean we all make mistakes. Nobody's perfect, and I think I certainly didn't play that hand at all well. But it was it was quite an, it was a relatively inexpensive mistake, so I'm not going to beat myself up too much. But if I'm going to call my students out for not having a plan on hand sometimes, I'm not beyond calling myself out too. And that was really quite poor from me in terms of planning for the future points in the hand. So it looks like we're having a just a minor quiet spell here in the video. This is going to happen when you're playing regular tables I guess which is why I'm using the 2x speed to fast forward through it. And sometimes you just end up being card dead. The problem with being card dead is when you're making a video is sometimes you wouldn't have things to talk about. But it's definitely something I need to work on for when I start producing the videos for Grinder School. Because just wibbling on like this probably isn't going to get the job done. Ah, here we are on table two. This is um, yeah, this is the hand against this guy where 
I mean, I'm thinking he's bad aggressive. I've called his under the gun race. Um, but yeah, I mean, his under the gun range is, is not going to be as, as good as a lot of people's under the gun range, most players. So I mean, I'm really, I'm really quite pleased with the situation right now. I've got top pair, good kicker with them, um, with an open ender. And um, there's lots of things I could do on this flop against this guy. I could check race certainly for value, knowing that if I do get called, I've got a bunch of equity still. Or I could just check call and keep his bluffs in. Um, he bets half pot. I'm more than happy to just check call here. I think I don't need to raise. And um, in the turn, now there's another draw developed. I kind of think I could I could have check raised here too. I don't know. I have to check raise by any stretch. I mean, the guy's putting decent sized bets in. We're getting enough value for our hand. I check call this bet. It doesn't really matter where value comes from, as long as in particular that money goes in on the street that you're, that you're comfortable with. And here, for example, I'm comfortable with anything from half pot to three quarter spot going in on this street. And that doesn't matter if I'm the one making the bet or he's making the bet. The fact the money's going in the pot's the most important thing. And then um, I didn't want to bet against a bad aggressive player and have him blow me off my hand with some sort of semi bluff or something like that. I kind of just wanted to get to showdown against him. And if he's going to keep betting my hand for me, then I was happy with that. I was happy with him doing that. Uh, the river comes to putting a potential full house out there. And his bet sizing changes quite dramatically. He's gone from half pot, half pot to just slightly more than three quarters spot. And it looks like he's actually, you know, put a bit of thought in this bet. It took a little bit longer. And this is where I think I just got a little bit stubborn. I kind of had a plan from the start, which was check call, check call, check call. But when someone's bet sizing changes from half pot to three quarters pot, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that their range has changed. As such, to me, he definitely has to have a full house here now. But um, yeah, I think it's like his last chance of value, and it looks like he's definitely value betting here. The problem I have is that I've just overtaken um, ten jack, which isn't a lot, but it's something. I've overtaken ten jack. Every draw's missed, so he could, well, we're just being bigger with the hand, like, who knows? He could have just had two clubs. Let's break to like eight, seven of clubs, something like that. He could have picked up spades on the turn, and that would just be bluffing with it. Um, I just didn't know enough about the player, and I'm quite near the top of my range. So, again, when I'm quite near the top of my range against a player who I suspect's bad aggressive, um, I just met the call. And I wasn't at all happy with it, but um, I don't think it's the worst call in the world either, not by a long way. And um, I met the call, it shows me the nuts. Well, not the nuts, obviously, in the river, but it's as good as the nuts. Which is a little bit unfortunate, but that's kind of, when you take them lines, sometimes you're going to end up paying off bets that you you don't feel too good about. But overall, I'm happy with my line throughout the hand. Um, I was a little bit nervous when his bet size changed on the river. But not so nervous that I thought it was still wasn't a profitable call. Here I thought was quite an interesting spot on table three. This fishy player has finally I think it's that dwindled down to to less than ten blinds and he just opened jams. And I really was torn with what to do here. I wasn't sure whether to three bet to say ten to just to make sure I get my isolation or to call. And then um, just expect nobody to call behind without a hand that's got eights in reasonably bad shape. Uh, but then it puts me in a bad spot if somebody squeezes. And then um, I wasn't really sure what to do. But in the end, I just looked around the table. I thought the only... Well, this guy looks like he may be a little bit aggressive, but I don't know enough about him yet. If anyone's going to be active, it's going to be his daddy works, gentlemen, on my, on my button. And I kind of decided that if I call and he squeezes, I'm just going to sigh and, and let my hand go. But I think most of the time, it's just going to, everyone's going to fall behind us and we're going to be able to get it in in pretty good shape against a bad player. And we didn't get it in in good shape at all, but fortunately, because um, you're in at less than 10 blinds, it really isn't a big issue when we lose there. 
I think the question there is just re-isolate, re-raise pre to isolate, to definitely isolate, or just call. And um, I wasn't really sure which was best, to be completely honest with you. Pre-elected just to call and then with the plan of folding to any further heat. Table three here, uh, table two, sorry, again, we're in a very similar situation. We were against this guy before, against this um, elder, of course. But then um, this time we have the we have the post stop initiative. So even though this is a good and bad flop for me in terms of it's good, I probably have the best hand. Bad because it's it's hard. It's hard for him to be able to call too many bets. But I think we definitely need to be value betting here. And then unfortunately the turn comes a spade and I think this is where it's as I said earlier it's important not to get too stubborn with these bad aggressive players. I mean I got stubborn earlier with the King Queen uh, when he had the straight, but then this is a pretty different situation and he's also gone with a big size, which kind of worried me after the last spot where he changed his size on the river and went big for value. Um there's a chance we still have the best hand here, but it's just going to get too expensive for us to stick around. Then if we call here, there's going to be like $34, $35 in the pot on the river. And I don't really want to check call if he's going to be betting like 28 or 25 or something like that. So um, I decided that to exercise a little bit of caution and make the fault there. But I, was, I was ready to play another big pot with this guy the first chance I got, because I think... He's definitely getting out of line a decent amount. And that's like kind of what I thought, you know, that's a feeling I was getting. Um, so again, straight away, the very next hand, we flop top pair, go kick against him and bet. And then this time, we actually turn a pretty good card for us. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, there's a chance that we the guy may fold if we battle the turn. I mean, we could blow him off a hand like, who knows, any kind of pocket. But I think, oops, sorry, that was my phone getting knocked off. Um, I think there's a good chance he's still going to be bad enough to call with all kinds of draws here. Um, and maybe hands like pocket sevens, pocket eights, those type of things, ace five maybe even. So I think there's definitely tons of value to get from this type of player. I guess a regular, I may sometimes want to check that card. Because my range is going to want to check here quite often. But I guess a bad player. I'm not remotely concerned about balancing. I'm just decided to bet that's part of two thirds pot for value. Um, he called, and obviously we get really it's a poor river because a lot of the hands that we were beating were now not beating. Um, I mean, so I don't think we can bet at this point because I just don't see. I mean, yeah, we, we can get some value from Queen Jack, Queen Ten, those types of things. I think it's probably going to bet them himself if he has them <coughs> excuse me and on top of that i think um there's every chance that um sorry i lost my train of thought now sorry there's every chance if he had a queen he would have raised before now too so i don't think he's got too many queens i think he's gonna have a lot of pocket pairs um some straight draws and some flush draws so when he i check to him and when he bets through the bet um, obviously I wasn't really wasn't too happy he's made another good size and it looks value compared to like the value that he made earlier but, um, yeah even though I don't think it's important not to get stubborn against these guys I think we're way too high up our range here to to check fold I mean he, he can have jack 10 I guess I mean I guess he can have flushes quite a lot uh, we're not getting the best of prices to to call this bluff here. We're, we're getting just a shade over two to one. But um, I think this is the time when I thought I kind of need to look this guy up. We can't keep letting this happen to us. Where we bet better than check forward on uh, on scary rivers and think trips with the book kickers just a bit too strong. He can definitely be value betting worse. He can definitely, I think, this sort of player could could turn them um, not deliberately but could unwittingly end up turning a made hand into a bluff here. There's just too much in his range that we're going to be 
surprise to be a header when we call. So I let you to call this time. And then, um, as you see, he's just double floated the glitch shot and then bluff with it. So I was quite pleased with that. I actually felt really pleased with that hand because I think I made a good fall against him earlier. Made a, I made one bad call against him. But overall, it helped, it helped me to build a picture of what kind of player I thought it was. And it just didn't feel quite right that time. Obviously, it helps when you've got trips. Having trips certainly helps you make the call. I mean, if I had, had I had ace queen there, and if that queen wasn't the queen of hearts, if it's a complete brick, I don't know, like e2 of clubs or something, and the nine come on the river, maybe I would have been less inclined to call. But the, really, when you think about it, there's not that much difference there between ace queen, if that's two, and king queen on that board. There's not a huge amount of difference. But um, yeah, I was really pleased. On table four here is something I very rarely do. Um, I very rarely see the A side boards into two players. I think when we get called and we're, when we're bluffing, we usually draw in close to dead. Um, I think when we see the into two players, our range is just inherently stronger for doing that. So when people call, their calling range they're usually a lot stronger too. Everything just becomes stronger when um, multi way pots are involved. So I just elected to just pretty much give up here. I mean, if somebody doesn't bet and return an eight or a queen or something, we can maybe consider semi bluffing them. But then, um, no, I'm not pretty happy with the check fold. Well, not happy with the check fold in terms of I lost the pot, but I'm happy with taking that line there exactly. I wasn't sure whether to call or three bet against this guy here. He looks really nitty, the fourteen ten, but um, that's based on an awful lot of four ring hands I played with this guy. I played him hundred nil four ring quite a lot earlier in um, earlier in the year and last year. So I suspect his his range. I think I check it later on, or I maybe just checked it and I missed it. I checked for his session stats. His session stats were twenty two fifteen, if I remember, which um. Kind of in line with someone who's, who's full ring 14 tens playing six max. You expect them to get a little bit looser. Um, so yeah, I think defending the king 10 when we have um, a fishy player still to act, defending it by calling is probably the best way to do it. I think three betting is not as good. If we only had regulars behind, I think three betting is fine. But when we have a weaker player behind you, we kind of want to get involved with. I think anything that discourages him from clicking the call button isn't a good thing. Right, when both these guys check, I think we have a pretty pretty obvious spot where we can just make a small stab and expect it to be fine. And it was, it was fine. I think when Expo checks that flop, he never has the ace, or rarely. So I'm only worried about um, Mr. Bing. Having an ace, which is entirely possible, Mr. Bing could have an ace there. But he's the only guy who I thought could have one. And again, there, I didn't, I elected not to three bet the, the Queen Jack suited because I wanted this guy to come in the pot. Unfortunately, he came in the pot and we didn't really flop very well. But yeah, we have on that flop, we had a, let just take it back first a little bit. We have two other cards and backdoor draws, but there are uh, two other cards and backdoor draws are fine to use when we can be aggressive or when we're being aggressive, but when we're taking a passive line, they're nowhere near as useful to us. So, um, yeah, we just decided to just when he when bet into two people, I decided just to just to exercise a little bit of caution again and just fold my hand. He is. An interesting pot on the not interesting because I've got aces, but it's not super interesting. 
But um, you see this again, how I use my my stats. Because against some players here, I would absolutely just flat the aces and then fast play them post lock. So what I do here, as you'll see in a moment, I put this pop up up. And you see me checking the fold to format stat. And even it's a ridiculously small sample. He hasn't folded to any format yet. It's only a form of four. But um, it might suggest one of two things. Either one, he just doesn't give up one C. Three bets. Or number two, he only three bets hands that he's willing to like three bet, five bet or stack off with. And obviously over that sample size, it's really hard to take any else, anything else from it. But it's it's worth something. It was, it's not completely worthless. So um, I did elect to form it, I believe. But just while we're on this, before we get to this hand, um, I opened the Queen King 3x under the gun here. We got min 3 bet by a weak player. I think I'm usually in jail in these spots, but for the min 3 bet, obviously we can't fold. So my plan was to just call this 3 bet and then hopefully flop something and and just try and either win a small pot or keep the pot small or just, just get out if he if it looked like he wanted to make it too big. And we flopped the good shot, which I think is um gives us a little bit of equity and I was tempted, I was really tempted to to bet this turn after he checks back the flop. But then the little nagging doubt in my mind of um and no offence to this guy, but fishy players, they do tend to make some silly checks sometimes when you've got the nuts hoping to induce bluffs instead of realising that we have the nuts so close to it so there's lots and lots we can get value from. You kind of go the other way with it and you kind of want to try and induce bluffs, which obviously the winning players we don't want to be doing. We want to be extracting value because people don't bluff enough, but this guy doesn't understand that. Um, so we, well, we're still trying to take two at a time if we can. I think I just check here on table three. It's a little bit awkward this with the timing. So we, we may as well continue talking about this first. See, Five bets and we get obviously a really trivial call and yeah jacks and fascinatingly we, we win the pot but um, on the turn there yeah I just check folded he made a large bet and then um, kind of expected him to do that at some point. Weak players do it a lot um, it's something I discussed with a student just the other week when he stabbed him and think a guy had min three bet him out of position the flopper come ace high. My student stabbed the flop with with a, with a hand that had showdown value and got raised off it. And just before it, we talked about how these bad players, these weak players, they will go for check raises after three betting pre with the red top of their range. And then um, who knows why they do it, but they do. And then um, it's just something you kind of have to be prepared for. And don't just auto assume if you're regular three bets and then checks quite often. You're going to be check folding or maybe check calling, rarely check raising with fish um, and recreational players. I think they're check raising a heck of a lot more. You know what I mean? I could be wrong there. It's, it's very generalised read. But um, when we don't have any other extra information, extra information to go on, I think um, I think it's fine. And again, just there, we just go back to this hand because I was making that point. Um, here's this guy again here. Um, I was just checking because I, it's going to be hard to get value against this guy. Um, he doesn't fall to see bets. I don't particularly want to blow up the pot with pocket fast and then get blown off it later on. If we'd bet the flop, bet the turn. And then the river comes in. You know, we kind of couldn't go for value again, especially on this run out. So I think I probably would have ended up check folding. So I just decided to just keep the pot small, try and get the short down. And then because I've kept the pot small, it means I can check call the river. And then as you'll see, it turns out with a bluff that we can pick off really quite easily because we managed to successfully keep the pot small. So yes, we are getting to Near the end of this video now. Um, as again, I'm not too concerned at the length of it because it is just basically me making a video and hoping to get some feedback. 
So if you have made it this far, thank you very much. And if you could give some feedback again, basically on uh, the video quality in terms of um, at the table too crushed up, as you find the audio quality. I do have a new microphone. Some people said the audio still isn't great. Um, it sounds okay to me, but um, I mean, I'm not quite asking for people's opinions if you're not going to listen to it. Um, and just the overall pace of the video. Not necessarily too concerned right now about how good or bad the strategy content has been. Um, if you disagree with some of my lines, that's not really what I'm looking for. By all means, if you have to disagree with something, please do feel free to ask me to clarify something. But, um, yeah, that's not really what I'm looking for now. I'm looking more for the overall production values and feedback on that. So if you could give me some feedback on that, either on Reddit, YouTube, wherever else I post it, um, it would definitely be appreciated. So yeah, uh, now we're getting to the video. This table has broken, unfortunately. This is what tends to happen. Fish post tables break. Fortunately, the table stayed around long enough for me to complete the video, but I don't think there's any more interesting spots from here on in. So um, I think we'll just pause for now. Uh, say thank you for watching. Thank you in advance for any feedback that you give. And um, until tomorrow, if you play, Please do be lucky and take care. Bye for now.